Amen. Good morning, church family. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you have your copy of God's Word, and I pray you do, I'd invite you to open up James chapter 4 as we continue our series, A Man Named James. Uh, <clears throat> when I was a kid, a long time ago, there, there was a character that, that was in a movie. His name was Rocky Balboa. Many of you probably remember Rocky. Uh, they, not only was Rocky 1 pretty popular, Rocky 2 was pretty popular, Rocky 3, Rocky 4. They, I think eventually they ran out of room in numerals uh, because they made so many movies about Rocky. In 2015, they had to change the name. Uh, and so the, the movie Creed was released in 2015. Now, uh, Creed is the son of Rocky's opponent slash buddy, Apollo Creed, who was killed by the, the nasty Ivan Drago in Rocky IV. Uh, what Rocky didn't know was that Creed had a, a son. Uh, so Adonis Creed is a young man who never knew his dad. He, he's, he's got boxing in his blood, and so he's a, a, a fledgling boxer and decides to seek out his father's best buddy uh, to teach him about boxing. Uh, so Rocky decides that he's not only going to teach him about fighting, he's going to teach him also about living. So in one poignant scene in the movie, and I'll refrain from a Balboa impersonation, he, he takes the young man to the mirror, and he stands in there, and he has him look at himself, and he says, see that guy right there? That's the toughest opponent that you're ever going to face both inside the ring and outside the ring. He said, I found that to be true in all of life. Now, Rocky is not a theologian, uh, but that was some pretty good advice. Because for all of us, when we look at, at what causes turmoil and conflicts in our lives, it's the man or woman in the mirror. It's us. Uh, James is, is a practical preacher. He is a practical pastor. And he gets right down to nuts and bolts with his congregation about things that he sees in their lives that are causing divisions and strife and conflict. And he wants to get right down to the heart of it. It, it doesn't take a lot for us to look. We don't have to do a lot of research to find conflict or arguments, fighting, lawsuits, uh, domestic violence, uh, severed friendships, and constant conflict. We all remember that Rodney King quote, can't we all? Just get along. Well, there's an answer to that question. We can. However, it involves submission to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, friends. And one day, peace is going to return. It's going to be restored to this world. But it's only going to be ushered in through Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. We can all get along, but we can't do it on our own. Now, James gets down to the nitty-gritty of day-to-day -day life, and he hits these issues in a real-world, applicable way. He wants his flock to be glorifying God, to speak the truth, to be doers of the Word, to watch our mouths, to hold our tongues, to seek wisdom, to show no partiality, to lean on God during times of strife and troubles and trials and su suffering and persecution. Uh, he has, mankind has, has suffered with conflict since the Garden of Eden. Now, I know that all of us, uh, all of us, uh, uh, suffering, conflict, that's all universal. And that's, these are the things that James is talking about. Things that apply to each and every man, woman, and child in this world. Uh, how many people right now are going through some kind of conflict? Uh, how, many, how many people are no longer speaking to a relative because of a conflict? How many people are contemplating getting a divorce today? How many people absolutely hate their jobs because they're in constant conflict? Conflict has a way of revealing whether or not our faith is real. And as we're going to learn today, real faith handles conflict by surrendering that, faith, that conflict to God. So we're going to be reading James, uh, we're going to be beginning chapter 4 today. It's on page 1012 of your Black Pew Bible. Uh, it'll be on the screen, and I'd invite you to stand for the reading of the Word of God. James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. What causes quarrels, and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Your desire, you desire and do not have, so you murder. 
You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne of grace this morning, grateful that we can do so through the shed blood of your son, Jesus. And Father, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that lives inside of each and every one of us, God. And I pray that that Spirit would be at work inside of all of us, Father. We know that there is a war going on in our hearts and in our minds. We know that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We know that peace is possible, but it's only possible through faith in Christ Jesus, through reconciliation at first with the Father, and then we can have reconciliation with one another. God, we thank you for the love that you demonstrated for us at Calvary. We thank you for the love that you demonstrated in that empty tomb. And we thank you for the abundant and eternal life that is available to us today. And we pray all this in the name of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. So three things, excuse me. Three things that James shows us today. He shows us the symptoms, the source, and the solution to the problem of conflict. Verse 1, he shows us the symptoms. Uh, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Now, James does not mince words. Uh, he's not very eloquent in his speech. He, he, he gives them exactly what they need. He gets right to the heart of the problem, and he says right up front that the major cause of conflict between you and other people is not the conflict between you and them, it's the conflict that is inside of your heart. Because it comes from our desires. It takes two to tango, and whenever there is a conflict, both parties are usually, uh, they share part of the fault. It, it's usually not a one-way street. There's, whenever there's two people involved in a conflict, both people uh, have a little bit of the blame to bear. The problem is that nobody wants to admit their side of the problem. Uh, I said a few weeks ago, uh, as a child, uh, our favorite words are, he did it, she did it. We like to deflect. We don't like to accept personal responsibility for our portion of a conflict. But James says if you want to get to the root and the heart of the conflict, we need to quit pointing fingers and start looking in the mirror. Bless you. The external conflict is always caused by internal conflict. Uh, outside conflict is caused by internal turmoil. And, and friends, this is one of the reasons why we so desperately need Jesus, because Jesus is the only one who can change us from the inside out. Uh, James is talking about our actions, our attitudes, our words, our conduct, uh, and, and he's, he's telling us that, that we need to be changed from the inside, just like with our words. Our words reveal our true faith. But our words come from inside of our heart, as do conflicts, because they come from our selfish desires. We are all born with, with the tendency to want what we want. We want other people to think the way we think. They want, we want other people to see our point of view. And when two people want their way, if their ways differ from one another, somebody is going to have to give up their way, and that causes conflict. Verse 3. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Now, I believe that James is speaking hyperbolically here. Um, I, I don't believe that his congregation was actually murdering one another. Now, I've seen some business meetings where I was, that were a little questionable. 
But I don't really think that's what he's saying here. But if we remember, Jesus likens anger to murder. Jesus likens lust to adultery. But when we don't get what we want, we don't get our way, what do we do? We try to hurt those who are standing in our way, the people who won't give in, who won't give ground. Now, we may not physically murder someone, but our words can murder. Our words can hurt. Our words can, can murder a reputation. Our words can murder someone's integrity. It can murder someone's self-worth. I remember an illustration I read a few weeks ago about Karen Carpenter and, and, and the, the power of words. If you remember Karen Carpenter, she died at the age of 32. Uh, she was a drummer. Her and her brother Richard used to sing, uh, Why do birds suddenly appear? You know that song. Uh, I, I won't sing anymore. She, <laughs> she had a beautiful voice. I'll just say that. She had a beautiful voice. But she died of anorexia nervosa. She starved herself to death because at one time when she was a teenage girl, somebody called her Richard's chubby sister. The power of words. Those words killed her. Actually, her actions killed her. But those words destroyed her self-worth. It, it stuck in her, in her mind and in her heart. She was always Richard's chubby little sister, even when she weighed 78 pounds. See, words are powerful. How, how many families, how many marriages, how many friendships have been ripped apart through selfish desire and hurtful words? Families haven't spoken to each other in years. I've met many people that, that have that story, and it is tragic. We we, we have all tried to hurt other people when we have conflicts and we don't get our way. Abe Lincoln was walking down the street one day with his two sons, and his two boys were bickering and arguing back and forth and back and forth, and somebody said to Lincoln, Mr. President, what's wrong with your kids? He said, the same thing that's wrong with the whole world. I have three apples, and both of them want two. Selfish desires, that's always the cause of conflict. You see, that the root cause of all conflict is selfishness. And that's the reason why James says our desires produces fights and quarrels is simply because the only way that you can satisfy every single self-centered desire that you have is by conquering the self-centered desire that someone else has. And until we understand our part of the problem, we're never going to solve the conflict. We will never reconcile a relationship. But the problem gets worse because your selfish desires will spill over even into your relationship with the Lord. And James gets to that. There's something I've learned as I've gotten older and older. The majority of things that we squabble over, that we bicker over, that we quarrel and fight about, really aren't worth fighting about. Amen. Amen. Second, we see the source of, uh, the, source of the problem. When we don't get our way, here's what usually happens. We try to handle it our own way. Now, if we remember what James said about worldly wisdom and godly wisdom, he, he's continuing his theme here. He's not just hopping around to different subjects. He's keeping a theme going, all right? We try to handle things our own way. Normally, our own way is not God's way. Listen to what he says. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly and spend it on your passions. Now, now he says here, you don't have, and at the end of verse 2, you don't have because you don't ask. That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? He's already said that we can get wisdom from above. How? By asking for it. But see, that takes humility, and that takes submission, which he's going to continue that theme very shortly. We don't have because we don't ask. Now, James is speaking here about our prayer lives. He's, he's speaking about talking to God. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I will sing that one. Good, that's a good theme for this morning. Take it to the Lord in prayer because we all have conflicts. We all have struggles. We all have selfish desires and sinful natures. And we need to touch base with God every single day. Now, James here tells us first about the problem of unasked prayer. You, rec you receiveth not because you asketh not. 
1 Samuel 12, 23, Scripture says, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. 1 Samuel says that to, to cease to pray is, is a sin. You can't have a relationship with someone that you don't talk to. Amen. That's what prayer is. It is a great weapon that God has given to us, a spirit-filled weapon. And we keep it in the case. <laughs> and we break glass in case of emergency. Some of the most brilliant and godly Christians I've ever known have, have worn out knees because they go to the Lord every single day. Oh, Brother Bill, you're so wise. Where did it come from? Well, I ask God for it. But you never seem to be in conflict with anyone. I give it to the Lord in prayer. You see, James is telling us, friends, how to live. He's telling us how to live our lives. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Do you know what that means? It means pray without ceasing. But be in a continual attitude of prayer. You know what that's going to do for you? It's going to keep you in a continual attitude of worship. Because that's what prayer really is. Prayer is worship. And that's why we include prayers in our services. Singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to the Lord, that's worship. Uh, giving your tithe and your offering, that's worship. Preaching and opening God's Word, that's worship. But so is praying. That's our intimate connection to the Lord. See, that's what real faith does. But you know what we tend to do? We will spend days and months and weeks and years in anger and bitterness against someone. And, and then we'll spend 30 seconds praying that God will intervene on our behalf. Break glass in case of emergency. That's worldly wisdom. That is not God's wisdom. If we would spend more time in fervent prayer, we would see God at work inside of us instead of praying, God, change that person to think like I think. You say, God, change me that I may think like you think, because that's what prayer does. Prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes us. Amen. It's a powerful tool. Wield it. There's also a problem of the unanswered prayer. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We are so selfish that even our prayers are poisoned with our own selfish desires, where we end up praying, God, we want our will and not yours. Or where we say, uh, God, uh, uh, if you have to have it your way, go ahead. I guess it's okay. You're not going to get an answer to that prayer. See, we, we treat God like a genie in a bottle. Uh, he's a cosmic Santa Claus. Lord, I'm backed into a corner here. I have run out of all of my options. I've done everything that I knew to do, and now I'm going to come to you to bail me out. That's what we should do first. God, give me wisdom. Help me to deal with this. I heard about a pastor that walked up to a little boy before service, and the little boy was sitting there praying. And the pastor was intrigued. He said, finally, my, my sermons are getting through to somebody. And so he stood there and listened to the little boy praying, and all the little boy kept saying over and over and over again was, Tokyo, Tokyo, Tokyo. Now, the pastor had to go on and do the service, but when the service was over, he caught the kid he said, son, I saw you praying before the service started. And the boy said, that's correct, sir, I was. He said, I, I don't understand. You kept saying one word over and over again. It sounded to me like you were saying Tokyo. He said, yes, sir, that's exactly what I was saying. He said, wow, were you praying for missionaries in Japan? W what were you praying for? That's wonderful. He said, well, I took a, a geography test last Friday, and I was asking God to make Tokyo the capital of France. We can pray for something, but we don't always pray it the right way. We don't always pray it with the right motivation. We can be so selfish that we can pray for the right things and not get them because we're praying for the wrong reasons. 
Some people pray loud and long, but their prayers are not answered. Their prayers get no higher than the ceiling because their prayer is unacceptable. Why is it unacceptable? Because it's based on the wrong motivation. It's not prayed for the glory of God. It's simply that someone may use God's favor to supply their lust. Their motivation is selfish and sinful, and God is not going to subsidize our sin. He's not going to underwrite our selfishness. God is saying that, that when we come and become a friend of the world, that we say to God, I want you to give me what you have so that I can commit spiritual adultery on you. And God is not going to do that. Uh, prayers that are unanswered are prayers that are given the wrong motivation. They are not for the glory of of God. And we, pray, we spend so much time when we pray, praying for selfish requests, and we wonder why God doesn't bother answering our question. When you have a conflict, quit focusing on what the other person is bringing to the table. And focus instead on whether or not you're going to God, listening to God, and glorifying God in your relationships. Evaluate the cause of the conflict, take a look in the mirror, and begin to eliminate you're part of the problem. Third, we see the promise of unhindered prayer. Verse 5, Do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Amen. Underline that Scripture in your Bible. It's, it's, it's in Proverbs and First Peter. And it's here in James, it's repeated three times in Scripture, and God has given it to us three times so that we remember something. That he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, he, he talks of the Spirit that dwells in us. What Spirit is that? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in believers. He empowers us, He equips us, He convicts us. He, he encourages us. He illuminates us and instructs us in God's Word. God's desire is that our heart would fully be given to Jesus. He does not want us to be a friend of this world because when we're friends of this world, we are committing spiritual adultery. We are at war with God. That's what that word enmity means. The Spirit is put in us to help us to love Jesus more passionately. Uh, when, when he says he, he gives more grace, wherever sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, because God's grace is inexhaustible. Uh, I know some of you know that I'm, I'm a, a, a coffee file. I love coffee. It's probably the only thing I would consider a vice in my life. Uh, it, it, I usually I stop at, at the local store down by my house and buy 224s. I consume one on the way here to the church. I carry the other one in, and I, 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 I sip on it until it's gone, and I probably go up to the store up the street and maybe buy one or two more. But after that, I'm done for the day, I promise. Okay, that's the, that's the extent uh, of it. But well, recently, uh, this store, and I won't say the name, uh, ran a, a, a deal where I think it was Thursday maybe, they had free coffee. Man, I walked in there, and I saw that sign, and I said, thank you, Jesus. All right. Now, I'm in there looking for, like, the, the big gulp cups, right? They didn't have those. I walked in and went to grab a 24, and the cups were gone. And, and I said, hey, y'all have any more cups? Well, yeah, those are all gone. The guys big, came in here early, got here before you. They, they used up all the 24s. Okay, so I, I got a 20-ounce reluctantly. got three of them. And get, get to my, my favorite blend, which is Colombian. I pulled the little trigger, and a couple of drops dribbled out. And I, and I said, um, excuse me, ma'am, <laughs> this is empty. Could you make? She said, you know what? We're already out of coffee. I said, what do you mean you have free coffee? Deal? I know, but we've had such a, such a, a, a huge response to the free coffee deal that we ran out. And I said, well, that doesn't do me any good at all, does it? And no, it didn't. didn't do me any good at all. And they didn't give me a voucher for like, you know, the next day or something, rain check. Well, I'm still a, little, still a little hurt by that. Nevertheless, let me make my point, God's grace never runs out. All right? It is free every second, 
of every day, of every month, of every year. It never runs out. It is abundant, and he gives more and more and more grace. It's always there, and it's always available to you. God's grace is abundant. God's love is abundant, and it never runs out. That's what James is telling us, that, that he, 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 his grace is, is, is more and more. Now, he will tell us, though, that, that God, gives, God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. Now, that word opposes is a military term. It means that it, it stands for an army that's ready for battle. What God is saying that if you're so proud when you're in conflict with somebody else, when you're not willing to admit that you're part of the problem, if you're not willing to reconcile the relationship, he says, you not only have a problem with that person, but you also have a problem with me. Amen. See, when you come to God humbly, he will hear you, but when you pray according to his good and perfect will, it is done. Uh, in, the, in our Bible study Wednesday night, uh, we're going through Philippians. And it's funny because when I started this sermon series, we were talking about some of the people who believe there's a, a contrast between Paul and James. This is the same thing that Paul says in Philippians. Humble yourselves. We are citizens of heaven. And we get into heaven not by rising high, but by the exaltation of God through the humiliation of Jesus through his sacrifice, through his shed blood, through his resurrection. That is the gospel, brothers and sisters. His grace is sufficient for all of our needs. He is the Prince of Peace. And he can solve all conflict. Pride is the source of the problem. Jesus is the answer. And that brings us to the solution to our problem. How do you deal with pride? James gives us a quick rundown here. Number one, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. As strange as it may sound, the only way to win the war with pride is to surrender. An unconditional surrender to the authority of God in your life. God wants you to be completely and totally surrendered to him. Now you can confess the Lord as Savior, you can believe in his resurrection, but until you put yourself under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, where he has complete and total control of your life, you're always going to struggle. You're always. Have you ever heard the story of Achilles? Uh, that, that, that Greek uh, myth, mythology? Uh, his mother wanted to make him immortal by bathing him in a, a magical river. And she dipped him in the water, she held him by the heel, and she put everything under the water except that heel. And so that was the only part of him that, that, that was invincible that Achilles heel. And some of us as believers have not completely surrendered our lives to the authority of God. Uh, whether it's your desire for money or for pleasure or for bigger and better things, that part of you which is not surrendered to Jesus Christ will cause you conflicts. Now we're seeing the ultimate piece of advice that James gives to anybody and everybody that's in the middle of a conflict, in the middle of a war, in the middle of a fight that's not getting any better. Submit to the Lord. Kids, submit to your mamas and daddies. Submit to them, because God said so. Don't be rebellious. Don't, don't, don't let your anger spill over. Your parents love you. Uh, submit to them. Wives, submit to the godly leadership of your husband. Uh, Ephesians 5 says it, and I know that S word makes some people cringe, but you don't know my husband. Listen, if you're not surrendering to the leadership of, of, of your, your husband in your home, you're not surrendered to God. You've got to submit to the Lord, and in doing so, that, that submission will flow through your lives. Husbands, likewise, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Laying down his very life for it. Love your wife. Counsel your wife. Don't criticize her. Don't berate her. Don't put her down. Don't make her feel like garbage. Because if you do, you can rest assured that you are not surrendered to God. Second, he tells us to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, have you ever thought about the devil fleeing from you? This angelic being who stood in the presence of God, being scared of you. You see, uh, 
there's times when I just wish the devil would leave me alone. He doesn't have to be scared of me. He just has to leave me alone. That would be good enough. But that never lasts for long. In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus said, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. We have power in us that God's given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And too often we don't know it. And we certainly don't use it. 1 John 4, 4, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. Overcomers. Victory in Jesus. We sing those songs all the time. But do you really believe it? Do you really believe that? You can resist the devil. How did Jesus do it? With the Word of God. See, Satan came at him, and all Jesus did was throw back the Word to him. It is written. It is written. It is written. And what did Satan do? He, he left until a more opportune time. Flee from you is what the devil will do. Prayer is warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He said the whole armor of God. He didn't say put on the belt. He didn't say put on the shoes. He didn't say put on the helmet. He said put it all on. But after you do, listen to what verse 18 says, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance. Prayer is a tool of supernatural warfare. When we put on the armor, we're just getting ready to go to battle. God's warfare is against the devil. And you know how God intends to win that war? Through the prayers of his people. Third, James tells us to draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, James is talking about the separation from the world. We cannot be separated from the world until we resist the devil, we cannot resist the devil until we submit to God, and we cannot submit to God until we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. But once we've made the submission, and, and once we have made the resistance, now it's time to be separated from the world. We come to Jesus, but we, we are citizens of heaven. Uh, again, it, it's funny how God dovetails everything, because we discussed this Wednesday night in our Bible study. That we are citizens of heaven. We're just passing through. And we need to be separated from the world. We are in the world. We are not of the world. And James tells us to go wash our hands. The hands represents our actions and our, our words and our works and our life. It, it centers on the, the ceremonial cleansing of those in the temple. How many times, mom and dad, have you told your kid, go wash your hands? And the kid says... My hands aren't dirty. And you say, yes, they are. I think in the last year and a half, we've realized that washing our hands can keep us from harm. Amen? It can. It can. It, um, the doctors recognized that years and years ago when, when infant mortality was at its all-time high. And an English doctor who was delivering babies wondered why these babies kept dying. Well, they weren't washing their hands. Uh, so he, he started washing his hands, infant mortality dropped drastically. See, we live in an infected world. Amen. And sin is exponentially more deadly than COVID-19. Friendship with the world is spiritually damaged because we live in a defiled and diseased world. We need to consecrate our lives to God daily. We need to be clean before the Lord. We need to be clean, pure, and godly. And that's our daily confession of our sins. James is speaking to Christians here, and he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. So those who say, well, once I'm, a, once I'm saved, I won't sin anymore. Well, the Bible contradicts your theology. We still sin. We just have less excuses for it. But we have a God who is willing to forgive our sins. That daily confession, he is faithful and just, he will cleanse us. With his blood, he will wash us clean. Now, what James is saying is we cannot come to God with dirty hands, with divided hearts, and with double minds. We can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. We can't have worldly wisdom. We need godly wisdom. Now, verse 9, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, 
and he will exalt you. Now, he was telling us about the life of humility. No one likes humility because of the word humiliation. No, no one wants to be humiliated. Many of you are thinking right now about the most humiliating thing that ever happened to you. No one wants that. No one desires humiliation. But the Bible tells us to live lives of humility because Jesus lived a life of humility. The incarnation itself is one of the greatest examples of humiliation uh, ever. God stepping down from the glories of heaven into this filthy, infected world, stained with sin, being obedient, uh, obedient unto the cross. That's what humility looks like. That's what a consecrated life looks like. I heard a story about an elderly minister who survived the great Johnstown flood of 1889, and he loved to tell this story, uh, the tales of this harrowing event. Uh, he, he died and went to heaven, and when he got there, he, he saw St. Peter, and he asked if he could tell the story of the Johnstown flood. And Peter said, well, you can tell your story, but just keep in mind that Brother Noah is in the audience. <laughs> We love to make boastful comments. We love to make much of ourselves. And the Bible says we are to humble ourselves. If you want to celebrate, celebrate Jesus. If you want to boast, boast in Christ, Galatians 6.14. Mourn and weep over sin. That's what James is telling us. We should weep over the things that God weeps over. The things that break God's heart should break our hearts. And he's telling us to display a contrite heart. He's telling us that as we draw near to the Lord, our sin should grieve us and drive us to repentance. Humbly coming to the Lord in faith and seeking cleansing. When we do that, he will exalt us in our salvation and in our sanctification. Come in a, with a humble heart, mourning and weeping. The Christian life is a happy life. It truly is. I've, I've been living it for three decades. It has tremendous joy. We serve a happy God. Jesus was a man of joy just as he was a man of sorrow. He was, a, he was accused of being a party animal, a drunkard and a glutton, because he loved people. And Jesus went wherever the people were, even if that was at a party that served wine. He, he even whipped up some for him. But Jesus was without sin. He went to where the people needed to be. Because that's what his mission was. To seek and to save the lost. I'm having a great time being a Christ follower. Uh, folks out in the world will say, Oh, you Christians, you're so stuffy, you don't have any fun. So you, don't, you don't know me. You don't know some of the characters that I know. We have lots of fun. See, I believe that as the Christians get older, we should have laugh lines rather than frown lines. Amen. I believe we should have joy in our hearts because our God is a God of joy. But when we see sin in ourselves and when we see sin in others, it should drive us to mourn and to weep. You have a family member that's unsaved? Be on your knees in tears with a broken and contrite heart before a God who hears and a God who heals. That's what God is looking for. Laughter is much greater than the tears in the Christian life, though, and God answers such prayers. He says He will exalt you, He will lift you up. Draw near to God, He will draw near to you. We've seen the symptoms, the source, and the solution. Allowing Jesus in our hearts to change us from the inside out because we all have a war inside of us and Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the one who can quell that conflict. For many of us today, our conflict is with God. We, we have, have fallen in love with the world. We are at enmity with God. The Bible tells us in Rome, Romans chapter 5 that before we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are at war with God. And guess what? God's going to win. He is going to win. We have to come to Him first. We have to come with a broken and contrite heart, uh, repentance and faith, mourning and weeping and asking Jesus to cleanse us of that filthy sin that has stained us. Once we have that, we can have war, or we can get over the war with each other. But we will never have peace uh, externally until we have it 
internally. But once we have it internally, we can have it externally. We are to submit, to resist, and to draw near to God. Now let me ask you a question. Has there ever been a time in your life that you can think of where you have been closer to God than you are right now? And if the answer to that question is yes, you have to ask a second question. Does the problem lie with me or does it lie with God? Because he never moves. We need to humble ourselves. God will exalt us. We need to surrender our conflict to him, give it to him. In fact, the way that we really get what we want out of life is to surrender what we want to God. And you might be thinking, if I surrender what I want to God, will God give me what I want? Maybe, maybe not. But I can tell you one thing for certain, he will always give you what you need. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for the love that you've demonstrated for us at Calvary. We give you thanks, Lord, for the empty tomb, which tells the world that we serve a risen Savior and not a dead man. I thank you, Father, for the sweet fellowship that I feel in this room today. I can feel your spirit present with us, God. My heart breaks for those here today that don't know you as Savior. I pray, Lord, that today your spirit would convict them of their sin, reveal their sin to them in a real and palpable way, and reveal yourself to them through the regeneration, to the washing of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lead them to repentance and faith in Christ Jesus. And for the, my brothers and sisters here today who are struggling with conflict, Lord, you have given them so many tools. You've given them the Holy Spirit. You've given them your word. You have given them a lifeline in prayer. Oh, Father, I pray today would be the day that they would commit themselves to be obedient to you. Because when they do that, we know, Father, they're going to live a life that they never thought they could live. Help us, Father, to draw near to you. Because you've promised that you will draw near to us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you, and you would like to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Our staff will be down front to receive you. We'd love to pray with you. If you need to be baptized, if you'd like to join our church, if you need somebody to, to pray with you, you're having a struggle today, uh, we'll be down here. The song that we're going to sing is a song that was sung the day that I was saved. And it reminds us that no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, Jesus will take you just as you are. But he promises not to leave you that way. Please come as the Spirit moves you.